The social organization of the chimpanzee rests more particularly on nonverbal communication, which is achieved mainly through gesture, mimicry, and vocalization. With human beings, when there is deficient or when there is no speech or audition, as in the case of deaf children, we know the important role played by nonverbal communication in interpersonal relations. Can we expect to find among children in a daycare center who are either not yet talking or just beginning to talk means of communication that could be compared to those of apes or deaf and dumb human beings? Let us first look at the relationships between children of 18 months. Each of these two children seems to be behaving in a world of his own. There is no true verbal, vocal, or gestural exchange between them which could be called communication. Each child takes what he wants without any prior solicitation or warning and seems to organize his activity without trying to establish any communication with the other. However, the child who just stood up has returned to exactly the same place opposite the other. Although the movements appear unorganized, they are in actual fact often made in relation to the position of the other children. A few minutes later, when the two children seem to have shut each other out, the child in the sand spontaneously offers his toy to the other, who smiles and then lets the toy be taken back. The offering gesture that has just taken place is one of the most elementary interactions of the young child. A second elementary interaction is reciprocal imitation. Offering and imitating the other are directly linked together. Here's an example. Frederick is offering some bread to his neighbor. He repeats his offer, then smiles and turns towards Nadia, who answers in the same way. Frederick makes the offer once again. The receiver sways sidewards with the top of his body, then leans forward. Frederick immediately does the same thing, offering, smiling, swaying sidewards and imitating often follow one another in exchanges that are made without aggression. A little later, Frederick, who made the offer, is imitated in his turn by the child who has received the offering. Here again, Frederick spontaneously offers a chocolate in a different situation. The other child does not attempt to keep the chocolate. Frederick also often receives offerings from the other children. Frederick, who as early as 18 months makes offerings and is appeasing, attractive and imitated, will become a leader when he is two years old. The offering can also be used to try to appease the child who is crying. A few seconds later, another child tries to appease the child who is crying by patting him and then coming and squatting down in front of him and smiling. A third child does the same thing. Patting, smiling, squatting form motor sequences which express and often bring about appeasement.
Contact can also be established by bending the head and bust sidewards towards the other child. This is the way that the girl in white brings Emmanuel out of his isolation. Emmanuel is usually dominated and rejected by the others, but here Emmanuel now takes the hand of the other child who leads him to the assistant. When the girl comes back, she turns around once again and spontaneously bends her head and bust sidewards. Now let us see how a threat is expressed. The child in the blue shorts wants what the other one is holding. The sudden and wide opening of the mouth with sharp sounds also appears in children of 18 to 20 months who find themselves in a competitive situation. Here they are trying to get at the legs of an upturned table when the rank order has not yet been established. In this case, the aggression does not appear or is not insistent. Everything takes place as if the vocal behavior either prevented or tempered the aggression. The vocal thread is found in a child who wants to occupy the attractive situation. This child expresses it again by moving his hands up and down as well when his place is taken by a more dominant child. Let us see now how the various threat elements are organized into a sequence. This child has caught his fingers. As he's in a competitive situation, he first laughs in the direction of the others, then waves his arms up and down, cries out, takes hold of the table leg, and hits the table. Does the behavior of appeasement and threat remain unchanged with children of two to three who have established a rank order? Let us watch, one after the other, three dominant children who have taken the legs of the upturned table. Christine, opposite us now, is characterized by frequent and spontaneous offering behavior patterns. After offering some chocolate to Nadia, she is now offering some to Frederick. To Nadia again. And now to the other children. None of them try to grab the chocolate. At table, Christine's offering behavior patterns are as spontaneous and frequent as before. When the refusal gesture of the other child appears, Christine stops and waits. Then makes her offering again as soon as the other child opens her mouth. Christine is the leader type of child who attracts and leads. Christine is very attentive to the responses of her neighbor and adjusts her behavior to that of her neighbor. When the other girl refuses and turns away, Christine goes towards her and places her hand on the girl's head and bends her own head and busts sidewards. This soliciting posture that we've already seen in babies from 18 to 20 months 
brings forth a new acceptance of food by the other child. The child who receives the offerings gives in her turn, following on a series of successive and ritualized offerings and solicitations, which usually originates with a leader, we can see that such a chain of reactions can appear when children are together. Nadia, another dominant child and a leader, expresses just like Christine frequent and spontaneous offering behavior. She is the most attractive child in the group. She only refuses when a child tries to take the chocolate from her. But she ends up by giving him some. Nadia smiles and assumes a soliciting posture when she gives back to the 18-month-old boy the car she has taken from him. She has the same behavior a few seconds later. Nadia can take the car again without causing the slightest offense or protest from the boy. Attractiveness, mutual tolerance, and exchanges rest on sequences of acts like those that have just been expressed by Nadia. Nadia spontaneously returns the car. At the table, Nadia puts a face cloth in her mouth before starting on a game. Let's watch the features of her exchanges with the others. A light tap by Yannick brings about the same type of act by Nadia, who redirects it onto a more dominated child. The repeated threats by Yannick stop Nadia's game. Then Yannick, who is also the leader type, solicits Nadia in a ritualized way. This provokes a smile from Nadia and interactions between her and Yannick and another child. The ritualized appeasements and solicitations play a large role in the reinforcement of the relationship and cooperation between young children. When Nadia starts a new game, she rubs her head, then the other children imitate her. The posture of appeasement and solicitation that is presented without words and without any other motor pattern by the assistant often brings about contact with the child. This posture can also provoke an offering. It can be followed either by an offering behavior or by the establishing of a contact. It can bring about an offering even from children to whom it is not directly addressed. The posture still has an attraction value even when the eyes are hidden behind dark glasses.
Let's now have a look at one of the expressions of threat. The sudden opening of the mouth, here in this case by Christine, who is intervening in a conflict, can be silent. A silent threat is often followed by pushing away or aggression towards the other child. Christine, who is appeasing and a leader, just pushes away the child she has threatened. The sudden bending forward of the bust by Nadia, who is on the right, is another form of threat. In a conflict, two children who are usually together exchange threats at a distance rather than aggression. The sudden opening of the mouth with loud vocalization, the head or bust bending forward and the moving up and down of the hands can be seen here with Nadia even when there is a verbal exchange. Generally, a conflict ends without aggression after an exchange of ritualized threats. Nadia, a leader, often starts new activities, and as well, she is also one of the most inventive children. Now, let us follow Raphael in detail. He was also one of the most dominant children on the legs of the upturned table. He is expressing threats all by himself and without any apparent cause. And he then directs and transforms them into aggression towards Emmanuel, who is one of the dominated children. Here, Raphael is threatening Christine, then the other girl, without any obvious reason. In this way, he often interrupts exchanges between the others. He often displays insistently aggressive behavior, especially in a competitive situation such as this one. Nadia came to stroke Raphael, and she in her turn must undergo Raphael's aggression. Raphael dominates through aggression. When Raphael has received a chocolate, the other children move away. Contrary to the previous cases, the children do not even try to get a piece of chocolate from him. However, one of the children lightly hits Raphael, who responds by a sequence of threats. He thus attracts a much subdued blow from Nadia. A few minutes later, a child finally approaches Raphael who makes no offer. Raphael's offerings are very rare or non-existent. When one child tries to take the chocolate by force, Raphael replies with very insistent aggression. Yet in children between two and three, there are already certain mechanisms which can channel threat and aggression. Here's an example from Yannick on the right, who is one of the leaders. Let's watch his behavior. First of all, he acts as if he were making an offering to his closest neighbor.
then he threatens the child who has taken his neighbor's cup and bangs his own cup. This child who is threatened bangs once again, thus channeling Yannick's threat into a sequence of reciprocal imitations. Another mechanism that often prevents the passage from threat into aggression between two children in conflict is the redirecting of the threat or the aggression towards a third child. Let us continue to watch Yannick. Another child takes the rabbit away from his neighbor. The assistant intervenes. And then Yannick appears progressively to lose interest in the conflict. However, a few seconds later, he threatens the child who took the rabbit. This child, who is normally dominated by the others, responds in the same way, but often directs his blows towards his neighbor, who is even more dominated than he is. Beginning with the exchange of threats, the two children then come to blows which are exclusively directed towards the most dominated. The passing on of aggression to the most dominated child is one of the main characteristics of conflicts among children between two and three. The dominated children such as Emmanuel, here in the foreground, who is rejected and rarely solicited by the leaders, keep away from the activities of the other children. Rejected and rarely solicited by the leaders, Emmanuel is often alone. When he interacts with other children, he does not often use mimicry, postures, gestures, and vocalizations. Emmanuel expresses himself in words. He has the gift of speech. Nadia, the child leader, hardly talks at all. She more often seeks to make contact. Eh? me raconter, Nadia, dis-moi. Qu'est-ce que tu aimes bien manger encore? Les gâteaux? Oh là là! Et quoi? Et puis... La purée. Hein? La purée. La purée. Et puis quoi encore? Raconte-moi. Even in this situation, Nadia is not more verbal, despite the fact that she's with one of her good playmates. The social interactions between young children are based mainly on non-verbal communication and are not directly linked to the development of language.
In trying to find the environmental factors that could influence the behavior of children, we have been able to make a correlation between the behavioral profile of the child and that of the mother, in particular during the welcoming sequence. Let us first look at the welcoming behavior patterns of Frederick's mother. Frederick is one of the most appeasing children in the baby group. His mother smiles, squats down, speaks quietly and kisses her child, and then lets him go without getting impatient. The mothers of leader children are all characterized by a large amount of personal availability and frequent appeasing acts towards the child. She gets Frederick to let the object go without behaving aggressively. She then takes him in her arms. Nadia is another child leader, and here is her mother. She squats down, speaks quietly to her daughter, and kisses her as she takes her in her arms. This is the welcoming sequence of another appeasing child. The sequence of maternal acts is just like the previous one. The mother squats down, kisses the child, and takes him in her arms. Now here's the welcoming sequence of two children who are more aggressive. In the case of the first one, there is no squatting down, no kiss, no taking the child in her arms. Now the second one on the left. The welcome by a father has fewer appeasement items. As we've already seen, the sudden bending forward of the bust is in fact one of the forms of threat for the young child. Moreover, the father does not welcome the child by picking him up. Everything suggests that the behavior of the young child is not directly influenced by the father. Let's try to better understand the influence of the home on the behavior patterns of the child. Your little boy was rather aggressive towards the other children at the daycare center a few weeks ago. What do you think was the cause of this? Well, there are many reasons. The first is, well, we had, to, my husband died last year. We lived in Belfort and we came back to Besançon. Then I got a job in Besançon. For about four or five months, I just felt alone and stayed at home by myself. We practically never went out. And as well, I had a job that was important and time-consuming with very long hours. I was working from 8 to 6 p.m. And so I used to get Raphael up at about 6 a.m. or a quarter past so as to be on time. And in the evening, I'd pick him up at half past 6. Then by the time we had done the shopping, it was 7 or a quarter past by the time we got home. Well, in my case, I just did not have the time to devote to him, to play with him, to be with him. We had dinner, and afterwards, well, I just put him to bed. In actual fact, I put him to bed at, at about 8 or quarter past 8. I see. However, we have noticed quite a change in Raphael's behavior over the last few weeks. He seems to be less aggressive now. What do you think caused this change? I'm pleased to hear that because now I don't work anymore and have a lot more time that I can spend with him. I still leave him at the daycare center, of course, but now, instead of being at the center for ten and a half hours, he's there for eight hours, seven or eight hours a day at the daycare center. This means that we have more time to go for a walk in the evenings. I mean, it's a lot easier to play with him, and I'm a lot more relaxed myself. And actually, things are getting better. I mean, things are getting better for me, and so I think things must be better at the center, too. And then there's another thing. 
We met before in December, I think, and we talked about Raphael's aggressive behavior. And that helped me a lot, because instead of being aggressive with him, I realized I had been aggressive, but didn't think it was bad. And now I have more contacts with him. It's more by gesture, as you explained to me. I get better results if I talk and discuss with him. If we can say that, it's much easier now. But this does not mean that from time to time I'm not aggressive, but actually I feel I'm making some sort of progress, you see. Madame, Monsieur, Nadia, votre petite fille. Your little girl Nadia is especially appeasing, attractive, and imitated at the day center care. She has the status of a leader. What do you attribute this to, Mrs. Durand? I don't really know. Well, there's already one thing that you must have realized. Since she's been at the daycare center, we've really tried not to stop her from doing what she wants to do. What I mean is, well, all you have to do is look at the walls of our flat. Her drawings are hanging everywhere. That's one thing she does like to do. Then she empties out all the cupboards from time to time. She wants to do that, but she'll put everything back afterwards. Let's say that we don't attach much importance to having everything tidy at our place. As far as possible, we let her do what she likes, when we humanly can. Even so, it mustn't get in the way of our own freedom, of course. That is to say, if we really have to, then I think that if it's dangerous for her, if we really have to stop her from doing something, we explain why to her. Then she usually seems to understand. Anyway, she doesn't do it anymore. It's all right. Do you think that you both spend enough time with Nadia? Yes. In the few moments that we have, we spend those with her. Of course, we both work. We think that we should spend what time we can with her since we have so little time. It's got to be spent with her as much as possible. And what do you think about it, Mr. Durand? Yes, well, I agree with uh, most of what Michel has just said. What we mainly tried to do, as far as what you call permissiveness is concerned, is to bring her up well, but of course she must be herself more than belong to us, as far as the freedom that she could have here is concerned. So as to be a little more precise, do you have a tendency to be repressive or do you prefer appeasement? On that point, I agree with what Michel just said a few moments ago. Obviously, in the sense that we accept that Nadia must be as independent as possible a person. Obviously, we try as far as it is not dangerous for her to let her do practically everything that it's possible for her to do in a flat, in a housing estate like this one. But there is one thing, and that is a certain way of being. That is, we're positive as we can be with her. It's always a thing that she does well that counts, and we always put the emphasis on the good side. What I mean is, when she does something that we don't like, we just let it drop, and it's all over with, done with. For example, we've never had to spank her. The idea would never even occur to us. I couldn't bring myself to do it, really. Yes, if she breaks a glass, I can't see why she has broken some, of course, and so have we, so have I. So I don't see why we should say anything to her. So it's done, that's all. Why should we scold her when the same thing happens to us? It is as if the behavior of the young child in relation to other children could be represented by a set of scales, on the one hand symbolizing the frequency of ritualized appeasements and solicitations, and on the other, the frequency of aggression. The same thing is true of the mother's behavior towards the child. When the mother's behavior is stable and includes a lot more ritualized appeasement and solicitation than aggression towards the child, the child's behavioral scales will tip in favor of ritualized appeasement and solicitation. On the contrary, when the mother is irritable and unstable, when her behavior pattern is more aggressive than ritualized, appeasing and soliciting toward the child, his behavioral skills will tip more heavily in favor of aggression.
As a general rule, when the availability and the behavior of the mother are modified by physiological, personal, or social factors, the mother's behavioral scales tip as well as those of the child progressively in the direction taken by the mother. When the reasons for this imbalance are reduced or disappear, the mother's behavioral scales tend to revert to their initial state. Those of the child also swinging back and tending to follow the tendencies of the mother. When one measures the adrenal cortex hormone derivatives which contribute to the organism's defense system in the mother's urine, one finds periodical daily variations from Friday to Monday. When the same hormones are measured in the child, one notes that their fluctuations tend to show the same pattern as that of the mother's in the period between Saturday and Sunday. Everything points to the fact that during those two days spent with his mother, the child feels the changes in the same environment in the same way as she does. The young child's behavior seems to be modeled on that of his mother, whether it be stable or whether it fluctuates according to variations in physiological or social factors.